We are in our study of the book of Revelation, and the class ended last week with a uh, question uh, or a comment from uh, Brother Booker. So before we begin any additional uh, study, I just want to have a, uh, be able to uh, address what he was uh, talking about and what he was saying. Because last week in talking about there being two dates in regards to the question of when was the book of Revelation written, there was a point that I made, and this was the point, that Jerusalem in Revelations 11, 1 through 3, would have to be little and still stand them. And of course, my intention of making this point was to show that to take the early date for the writing of the book of Revelation, many people use Revelations 11, verses 1 through 3, to serve as proof that the temple was still standing and that Jerusalem was still uh, intact. So Jerusalem and the temple were still uh, standing and had not been destroyed. And I hope that I made it clear in the two introductory lessons of this book that since symbols are so much a major part of the book of Revelation, that Revelation 11 does not of necessity prove that Jerusalem and the temple are still standing when John penned the book of Revelation. So I want to go back and look at some of the things I said in regards to why I take the, and why it's in my understanding, and this is not to in any way diminish the disrespect or put down anyone else who believes in the early day. But in order to teach the class, you've got to take one of, one of the other dates. So I have been convinced based upon evidence that is to me conclusive that the book was written at the later date. And so I want to give again my reasons for choosing the later date. And again, I want it to be emphasized that it cannot be definitely proven that Jerusalem and the temple were still standing, even though we have that reference made in Revelation chapter 11. And of course, again, one thing that we must never forget is that symbols are a major part of the book of Revelation. And we cannot be absolutely positive that Jerusalem and the temple are still standing. In fact, the book of Revelation itself indicates that Christians were being persecuted because they refused to worship the emperor, the emperor of Rome. And there was no demand from all of what I've been able to study, and I'm certainly not a historian, and I'm certainly not a scholar, but from all that I've been able to determine, there was no demand for emperor worship during the time of Nero, which would have been the period before the destruction of Jerusalem. In fact, we know he persecuted Christians. There's no doubt about that. But it seems that he persecuted Christians to take attention off of himself because he was suspected to have been the one, though they don't think they ever did prove it, but he was highly suspected of being the one that set fire to the city of Rome. And I think I made that reference last week that when you, first thing I think about when I hear the name Nero is that, that uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. So Rome was destroyed to a great extent by fire, and it was him that was suspected. But to get the attention off of himself, he blamed Christians for having set the fire. So the other thing is Nero's persecution was confined to Rome. 
and it never really reached the outer parts of the Roman Empire. And we know that the Roman Empire had conquered pretty much all of the known world in its day. And two, another thing that helps me to think about the latter day being the one that uh, when John wrote the book, was that exile was never mentioned as a form of punishment during the reign of Nero. In fact, it was way too civilized for the city of Rome at that time. We know that each and every emperor had his own agenda, and it was just during the time of Nero that he, to exile somebody was not really any form of punishment at all. They, they had more, more gross, more uh, what they would consider uh, viable means of doing that. And two, another thing that I think about is that in regards to the churches, the seven churches of Asia, many of these churches had only been established a few years if John wrote the book of Revelation before 70 AD. We know that Paul made three missionary journeys. And the best we can put time together, the first missionary journey was approximately 48 AD. And the period of time it took to make the first journey, then the second journey, and the period of time involved with that, and then the third journey, and the period of time involved there, it's relatively easy to say that it was from about 48 to 56 AD that Paul conducted these missionary journeys. And of course, we know in those missionary journeys, churches were established. So if the book of Revelation was written before 70 AD, these churches would have been 20 years old or less, which to me would make it a little difficult for them to have digressed to the point that many of them did as we'll be studying the letters that were addressed to them in chapters two and three. And another thing is, there's nothing in the uninspired writings of the early Christians, sometimes we refer to these as the church fathers. I'm sure you've heard that term before, I've used that term before. But there's nothing in those uninspired writings that make reference to Nero. Most all references by those early Christians in those writings that they did, you know, we've said that we can take the writings of these early Christians and pretty much put, put the Bible back together again if it was ever, if we ever just ever lost it. But it's just another means of confirming that the Bible that we have is God's word. That they quoted from it and made great use of it in their writings. But it's interesting that none of them made reference to Nero, but many of them made reference to Dominican. The Minotan, of course, ruled after the destruction of Jerusalem in about 85 to 90 AD. Some of these quotes of some of these church fathers were, one of them was Irenaeus, who was Irenaeus V. He said that the book was written at the end of the rule of the Minotan. Victorious says John wrote what he saw while on the island of Patmos by order of Dominican. And the same was stated by these other individuals that I'm not gonna, with the exception of Clement of Alexander and Jerome, I'm not gonna try to pronounce their names, but they indicated the belief of the early church that the book of Revelation was written during the reign of Dominican's persecution. Whatever the date, whatever the date, the overall point of the book of Revelation is it doesn't change. 
It's persecution, whether at the hands of Nero or at the hands of Dominican. The purpose of the book of Revelation is to Christians who are being persecuted. Times of persecution are times of great temptations to abandon your faith. And so the book of Revelation was written during these distressing times, whether Nero or whether Dominican, and the message for us is all down through the ages, regardless, if and when persecution arises, as Christians, we need to remain faithful, no matter the persecution, no matter how bad the persecution, no matter what the reason is for the persecution, and no matter at whose hands the persecution is taking place. So really, whether the date is before 70 AD or after, the overall message of Revelation remains the same. Christians under any form of persecution remain faithful because the victory is in Christ. Be faithful, and of course, we've all, how many times have we heard Revelations 2 and verse 10? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So, Jeremy, I hope, hope that further explains and that make whatever comments you like. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't put much stock in the external evidence. I think there's enough internal evidence in, in the New Testament that, including statements that Jesus made that would support, support what I believe to be the early day writing. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue, because I'll just make it known, and I won't, you know, I won't make um, much of it. But I, I don't, I, I don't see Christian. I don't see the persecution that you're referencing in this book. Not to the degree that it's the primary, the primary theme of the book. I, so I'm waiting to see what evidence there is that these are Christians being persecuted and possibly, in my view, not Jews, um, with Christians being the backstory. Um, so I do think there are people being persecuted in the, book, in the book, but I don't think it's the primary subject matter of the book, because I believe that I believe the book would be teaching the desolation of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem. Same thing Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, 24 23, 24, 25. I think that is the primary thing. I don't believe that the Bible, the Book of Revelation, is teaching nothing, anything different than what we already know that's been taught in the New, Co the New Covenant. Now, I do think there may be a slight, there's a bit of future because he, he opens up the book by saying, "Blessed are those who read, hear the pro the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand." So he, he does say that it's a prophetic book, as far as I know, it's the only prophetic book in the New Covenant. But again, and my reason for my question was because in, in chapter one, he obviously talks about, he references some things that are past matters, events, some present events that John was to write, and some future events that John was to write. So my point was, Jerusalem could still be standing because he's prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem. So at the time of his writing, Jerusalem is still standing at that time that he's writing the book, later destroyed in 70 AD. So that's my position. And like I said, I'm going to give, obviously, I'm curious to hear some of the evidence for that view because I don't see the persecution of Christians in the book I don't, I'm trying to be careful not to use external evidence to try to support my view. Um, and that's, that's kind of why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. Where is the evidence for, where's the evidence for the late day in the scriptures, via the scriptures? So uh, that, that's my viewpoint on it. Okay. And I appreciate it. I appreciate what you said, and I understand that you're certainly not alone in 
there were things you said about the date and everything. So that's, you know, whenever the study of Revelation is, comes up, that's one of the things that certainly is a fundamental issue about it was when, when was it written? very little external evidence of any Christian persecution under the mission. Like, I'm, I haven't found any real evidence of that. You might have some, but I'm just curious where that where that comes from. Okay. Other than other than the few statements. I'm, I'm familiar with the um, um, Irenaeus. He was, you know, his, uh, his, his statement that he made about the mission, but hmm. there's, some, there's some speculation about what he really meant by by, by that statement. So that's why I have a problem putting any real, like, I don't want to base my belief system off of some external statements made by men who I don't know what, you know, what they were doing. Right. I was right. hired, man. Okay. Anything else, anyone? So tonight we want to begin, like I said, the last two weeks we've looked at what I consider to be a very important thing, and that is to look at the matters that helps us to better understand the book that we're going to be studying, because it is a different book. It's a very unusual book, and it certainly is a book that stands out in sharp contrast to the way it's written compared to any of the other books in the New Testament, and for that matter, the majority of the books in the Old. But we do know that the statement that we've made is, the better our knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament, the less mysterious, the less confusion I think there can be concerning things and phrases that we'll be looking at in Revelations. So, the book of Revelation. I'm going to put all that up there. Sorry about that. In chapter 1, and... I have to see, there may have been two or three that came in, and I had some pa papers passed out that really are just uh, questions. Uh, Sid, you came in, and uh, I believe uh, Todd, and it is. Let me do another one. All right. Is that everyone? All right. <clears throat> These are things, the, the, what I'm handing out is just things to help you help us fill in concerning the things that we'll be going over. And it's just uh, primarily for our benefit and helps us to uh, uh, make use of it. <laughs> so in Revelation chapter 1, in our introduction, we did an outline of the book. So let's, let's sort of remind ourselves before we get into the, the verses themselves a little bit of that outline. We said that chapters 1 through 11 are dealing with the struggle that's taking place on earth. The church is persecuted on earth, but God avenged the church. And we know that Christ is in the midst of the seven churches in chapters 1, 2, and 3. That in chapters 4 through 7, there is the book that contains or has the seven seals. And in chapters 8 through 11, we see the seven trumpets of judgment that are sounded in regards to this struggle and God taking a vengeance upon those that are the persecutors. Then it's in chapters 12 through 22, the rest of the book, that Satan makes war with the saints. But we see Christ and the forces of heaven gain the victory. The conflict between heaven and earth, we see in the conflict between the woman and the dragon in chapters 12 through 14. We see Seven Bowls of Brass, chapters 15 and 16. We see the fall of the great harlot and the beast in chapters 17, 18, and 19. We see judgment being brought upon the dragon, which we know 
is clearly identified as Satan in chapter 20. And then we see mention made of the new heaven and the new earth in chapters 21 and chapters 22. So that we, we looked at that review or that outline. Uh, I remember if it was in the first, uh, first introductory lesson or the second, I can't recall. So with the Bibles open to Revelations, Revelation, let's read the first eight verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and those who keep things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him, which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the king of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they shall, and also they that pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth will wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which was, and I'm sorry, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. So looking at verse 1, <clears throat> which is what I would certainly call a key verse. We see that the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So looking at our questions on a handout sheet, from this verse, who was the source of this revelation? It was God, wasn't it? What was the chain of communication through which this revelation came from God to his servants? What do we see? We see what? All right, we see first and foremost, it comes from God. He is the source. He gave it to who? Christ Jesus, who gave it to his angels, who gave it to John. So that's the chain of communication that we see addressed and stated in this verse. God, Christ, his angels, and John. And John is the one that penned the book. And we said last week, it is not John's revelation. <laughs> it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this truly is a key verse. And the other question here is, when were the things described in Revelations to take place? What about this verse? What does it say? Shortly. Must shortly take place. And we see that all throughout the book of Revelation. We see it in chapter 1 and verse 3. Let's look at it. We read that. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So we see it in verse 1, we see it in verse 3, just within the same chapter. 
Now, let's look at chapter 22. Um, I'm going to be a little out of order on it. Yeah, I think I'm going to hold on just a second. Uh, still back on, on uh, the first verse. <clears throat> there are a lot of, and that's why I call it the key verse, because there's a lot of, of key points that are made in this chapter, in this verse, rather. And that is the divine source, and we've already said that was God. We see the divine channel through which the communication came, Christ, from God to Christ, to the angel, to John, to then the servants, to whom that it was intended to end up with it. We see a divine timeline, again, in chapter 1, verse 1, but also in chapter 3, I'm sorry, verse 3. And then, notice in chapter 22, someone read that for us, verse 6 and verse 10. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. The Lord God of Jehovah prophet said to his angels to show his servants that things were must shortly take place. Verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. All right. So in Revelation chapter 22, we see again what we've been introduced to already. So it's stated in the first chapter at the very beginning, and it's stated again as the book is about to come to a close. In the last chapter, verse 6, and in verse 10. Things which must shortly be done. And then verse 10, for the time is at hand. So that's the divine timetable concerning the things that John is writing about. And this, this is why there are so many that take the idea that the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled and it doesn't mean nothing for us today because of terminology like this. But that has nothing to do with whatever concerning the application of the principles that are being discussed in this book and how it relates to us as Christians down through the ages, not, not just 21st century, but everything from the first and second century all the way till now any time of persecution, the book of Revelation has meaning, it has application. But it certainly, as we said too, and wanted to stress to make sure, it had to have meaning to those to whom John wrote it to. And while that clearly is seen in these verses that we're examining concerning the timeline, that's, still to, that's not to eliminate the application that it can be of meaning to us. And then there's one other thing concerning what we see in this verse. And that is the divine method of conveying or the divine method of revealing. And he reveals this message through, as the verse says, signified. And we know already as we've looked at our introduction that there is so much that the book of Revelation is made up concerning symbols, and we even talked about how the, the symbolism of numbers plays a great role in the symbolism, the, just, just the sheer use of numbers and what those numbers symbolize. So that's the divine method that was given to the book of Revelation. It's, like I said, it's different from Matthew through Jude, and it's different from the majority of the books of the Old Testament, although we talked about three that are written of this type or this style of writing. But basically, it's a very different book to read and to comprehend because of the symbols. But the symbols have meanings. They have their dual, their double meaning. So I think this is certainly something that we need to keep in mind as we consider a study of how important this verse one is. 
It gives us the source. It gives us the channel through which the book came to the servants. It shows us God's appointed timeline for its fulfillment. And you see that he uses the medium of symbols. And we talked about that. I think in our first introductory study, and we'll talk about it more as we go on into our study here concerning why did the Holy Spirit word the book of Revelation the way that it's worded? Any comments, any questions? Okay, now having read these first eight verses, John will show us and I think this is interesting and something we don't need to, to overlook. John will show us everything he saw. He saw. Don't forget that. God chose him. And John describes what he sees. So it's almost like being given a picture and describing that picture. So these were not directly revealed words, obviously, but the vision and John was made to see these things. So yes, there was divine inspiration involved in it, but, but let's not forget the aspect that this is, that, that John is receiving visions and he's describing these visions. The Holy Spirit is helping him to describe the things that God puts before him. So many times, and I should have took time to do it, but I didn't. So many times, all through the book of Revelation, John said, I saw. I saw. All through the book of Revelation. And so... John will show us everything that he saw. We see that in verse 2. <clears throat> Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And since we didn't read verse 11, let's, let's look at verse 11. Someone read that one for us. Seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Pisidia, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. All right. Now again, we saw in verse two all things that he saw, and now in verse eleven, Jesus speaking to him says, "I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last." What thou seest, write in the book. So let's, let's not forget what seems to be the fundamental way in which John is given the book of Revelation. It is through the things that he saw. And he says, yes. How many? 36. 36. Okay, thank you. I knew it was a bunch. <laughs> so, those who read, those that hear, and those that keep these words are blessed. We read that in verse 3. Look at it again. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein. So, those to whom that received this letter, this book, they're to read, they're to hear, they're to keep. And that's given throughout the book. Chapter 14 and verse 13, someone read that one for us. Rest from their labor and their works. 
All right? Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. How do we die in the Lord? When we hear, read, when we hear, and when we keep. That's the way we die in the Lord. Look at chapter 16. And someone read verse 13. I'm sorry, 15. Chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Blessed is he that walketh and keepeth his garments. So again, he that is reading and hearing and keeping the things that of this book. All right, in chapter 19, someone read us verse 9. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So the necessary conclusion is those that have been invited to the marriage supper <laughs> would be those that have heard those that have read and those that have kept both fail. And one other one, well, a couple other ones. Chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And of course, this is referring to the resurrection because of the person's righteousness, having, as you said, read, heard, and kept. All right, chapter 22, verse 7. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy. All right, go ahead and read verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. I'm sure we all recognize verse 14 because we have a song that we often sing. Blessed are they that do his commandments. So truly, all through the book, it is to those that read, those that hear, and those that keep. These are the ones that are blessed. So, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things that are written in it. We see a greeting, call it salutation, being given in verses 4 and 5 to the seven churches. And the greeting is grace and peace from he who is and who was and who is to come. So that's who the greeting is from. But also the greeting is from the seven spirits, which are before his throne. And the greeting of grace and peace is from Jesus Christ. So we see all persons of the Godhead being made mention of. Remember we talked in one of our introductory lessons, I think it was the first one concerning the numbers, that the word or the number seven is a perfect, it's a complete number. And so we know that Ephesians 4 and verse 4 says there is but one spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit. But yet here we see the seven spirits of the seven churches. But again, symbolism coming into play, it's just having reference to the Holy Spirit being perfect, being complete. Not that there is seven literal spirits because we know that there is but one spirit, just like there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and all of that that's mentioned in Ephesians chapter four. And also, Maybe we'll have time. We may, may get caught with time. Looking at what we see in verses 5 and 6 that gives us seven descriptions of Christ. And these are truly interesting. One is, 
He is the faithful witness. And we certainly see that to be the case. In John chapter 8, someone read us verse 14. So he is a faithful witness. He bears witness of who he is, where he came from. All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. And read verses 1, 2, and 3, someone. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke, spake in time past to fathers of the prophets, who has in his last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, who, who, whom also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. All right, our time is up, but let's let's finish this point by looking at John chapter 18. Someone read this verses 36 through 38. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world, and my kingdom were of this world, and my servants would find. So that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not of Jews. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. Or this cause I was born, for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. All right, so again. Jesus is a faithful witness of who he is, where he came from, and of the truth. So that's one of the descriptions. And Lord willing, in our study next week, we'll look at the remaining six that we find here in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Appreciate our comments. Appreciate our time together. And keep the papers and continue to work on them. Uh, something that we can do on ourselves, on our, by ourselves, on our own, and then we can come to class and study them together. Thank you so much.